number 1726. Uh, in the objections, uh, we're talking about the Council of Jerusalem. Even after the decree of the Council of Jerusalem, it was preached in the Church of Galatia that the Judaic observance pertained to faith, but St. Paul wrote an epistle to this church as if it had never been cut off. Uh, from this it follows that the unity of faith was not required for the members of the church. So the response, I distinguish the minor. Paul did not think that the church was cut off with regard to those who erroneously professed that opinion concerning the legalia, I concede. In other words, he, he was saying that some have been misled, but not through their own fault, just uh, thinking that it was true. Pertinaciously, I deny. You see, So they were not pertinacious heretics. Formal heresy and not material cuts off from the church those who are in error. All right, so that's an important point. You see a footnote. This principle is very important in order to understand the ecclesiastical st status of members of the Novus Ordo who accept the heresies of Vatican II through invincible ignorance. So that's true of many people. Not all, however. Those who are in invincible ignorance are members of the church materialiter, that is legaliter, and formaliter. In other words, if they're baptized Catholics and they are in invincible ignorance and professing certain things, even heretical things, through invincible ignorance, they are in the church both materialiter, that's legally, and formally, in other words, in fact. Those who accept them and are at the same time knowledgeable of the church's teachings are cut off from the church formaliter, they are outside the church but not materialiter, in other words, that they still have the legal connection that was received at baptism. This was the state of Nestorius between 428 and 431, and of Luther between 1517 and 1521. They were both public heretics in that period, but they had not been legally separated from the church until the second date. Formal heretics who adhere to non-Catholic sects are outside of the church, both formaliter and materialiter. So Lutherans are outside of the church both in both ways. They have no legal connection to the Catholic Church. Material heretics who, who are in non-Catholic sects may belong to the church formaliter by desire. See, so they may, if, if they are in invincible ignorance, and also posit some other, they have to have the Catholic faith, at least, in other words, that they have to at least desire to believe everything that God reveals, and we are required to believe, at least that. See, And they must have certain objects of faith, such as, at least, as the, most theologians say, God exists, and he rewards those who seek him. That's from the Epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, other theologians would require more, like St. Alphonsus says, um, uh, the um, Incarnation and the Blessed Trinity. Uh, so even implicit, but not materialiter. See, so even if they are uh, belong to the church in voto, they are still legally detached from it. Canon law presumes that those who are of the age of reason and who belong to non-Catholic sects are formal in their heresy. See, so they are legally presumed to, to profess the heresy. But they may not, in the sense that for one reason or another. Uh, for, ex for example, in our school, our virtual school, the star of the Catholic catechism uh, is a Lutheran boy. <laughs> he gets up and recites his Catholic catechism. He says the rosary. He has all of these devotions, Catholic devotions. I mean, he, is, he may not be truly a heretic. It doesn't sound like it, but he's, he is Lutheran. See? So it, it could happen. See? And uh, so that, that states everything. And, and uh, the... Um, um, 
So again, that's the basis for Bishop Gerard's thesis. And one of the proofs that I give for that is that when you return from the Novus Ordo, you don't have to do any, no priest requires an abjuration of heresy and a lifting of an excommunication. No traditional priest that I know of. Because there's no material or legal bridge to cross. You're already in. You see, the, the only thing to cross is a, a the, we just have to ascertain the fact that you no longer adhere to the ideas of the Novus Ordo and you no longer go to the Novus Ordo Mass, etc. In other words, you reject the new religion. See, everybody does that. Now, if, if they were in the same condition as a, as a Protestant sect, like the Lutherans or the Episcopalians, you would have to go through the process of abjuration and lifting of the excommunication. So that, that's, in other words, my point is that, in fact, everybody is doing that. The only way that that would make sense is if you agree with what I'm saying here. So, if, however, now this is your author, this anything in, in black here is your author. If, however, among the Galatians there were some who were pertinacious in error, it is certain that they defected from the unity of the church. So, pertinacious heresy uh, detaches you from the church because the, the first attachment that you have to Christ is through the faith. That's why the first question at baptism is, uh, is concerning the faith. Okay, so it is impossible to be attached to Christ if you do not have the virtue of faith. And it is therefore impossible that you be attached to his church in re, in reality, if you do not have the virtue of faith. The only thing that is left is a legal attachment because of what happens at baptism. You are drawn into the church as an organization. So therefore, and this is my note, formal heresy automatically detaches someone from the church. For St. Paul condemned the error as another gospel. He recalls the apostles of error false brethren uh, in the, the footnote, this is my footnote, false brethren means that they are not true Catholics, although they obviously have the appearance of being so. Otherwise, he would not refer to them as brethren at all. You, you know, in the early church, uh, they referred to the church as the brotherhood, the fraternity. You know, there's cases like that in the epistles. Uh, and so brethren means more than simply you know, people we know. It, ha it refers to members of the church. This applies perfectly to the Vatican II hierarchy who are apostles of error and indeed are false brethren, but for an ever greater reason, uh, and for a ver an ever greater reason, false bishops and false popes. So, uh, he calls he and he calls uh, he says twice in this in the epistle to the Galatians anathema sit, I wonder that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ, meaning himself, unto another gospel, which is not another. Only there are some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, and this is the famous quote, though we that means an apostle referring to himself, or an angel from heaven, preach a gospel to you besides that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. I mean, is there anything to add to that? That means that the, the religion that you adhere to must be apostolic. It must have a unity with what went before and a continuity if you get a new gospel, anathema sit. That's the worst possible thing he could say. In other words, there's, there's no greater 
uh, censure that he could put on it than anathema sit. Now watch what he says. As we said before, so now I say again, he says the same thing twice. If anyone preached to you a gospel besides that which you have received, let him be anathema. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? If I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. For I give you to understand, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. As it's divine. For neither did I receive it of man, nor did I learn it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That means Christ communicated to him personally the gospel. So he didn't learn it from the apostles. He had a direct revelation from Christ. A very important text. St. Paul says, but because of false brethren unawares brought in. You see, unawares brought in. In other words, they didn't realize it. Who, in, who came in privately to spy our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into servitude, meaning the observance of the old law, to whom we yielded not by subjection, uh, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. In other words, don't have anything to do with the heretics to whom we yielded not by subjection. No, not for an hour. So much for uh, getting together with the modernists and reconciliation with the Novus Ordo. Not for an hour. So it, it, it's very apropos to our own time, that, that quote. I have a footnote here someplace, 37. Where is my... 39, yes. Look at the, this is again my footnote. This text is extremely important in the battle against the modernists. For the modernist argument typically is, Vatican II has been promulgated by apostolic authority. Therefore, it is Catholic, and you must accept it. That is right, that's the first thing they, they put up. The response to them is, this doctrine contradicts what has been previously taught. So the question arises, which comes first? Faith or apostolic authority? In other words, do we say, if St. Paul comes and teaches us a different gospel, do we say, well, you're an apostle, therefore I accept a new, new gospel? Or do we say you're contradicting faith that we received from you before? That's the question. St. Paul here clearly indicates the faith, for he explicitly mentions the possibility of his own defection from the faith and of his preaching a gospel different from that which had, has been preached. Furthermore, since apostolic authority is known through the faith, it is clear that faith is prior to apostolic authority. You know that the church has the power to teach, rule, and sanctify by the virtue of faith. Uh, and I wrote an article, Faith or Apostolic Authority, which comes first. I wrote an article about that. But that, that, is, that is typically the, the argument that comes from Novus Ordo. You, know, you should obey. This is Vatican II. He's the Pope. And you know, get in line. And, well, are you in conformity with the, the gospel that has been preached to us for 2,000 years? See, so... Uh, you know, it's just for your own, don't, uh, how would you say, apologetical approach to Novus Ordo. This is a very important part. When I say apologetical, that, not that you're apologizing, meaning you're defending. <laughs> you have to get that word right. 
uh, objection three, the unity of the fundamental articles is rejected by Catholics since it is uncertain. But this would not be uncertain if those things were taken as fundamental, which sacred scripture explicitly teaches. Therefore, the unity of fundamentals is sufficient. Response, I distinguish the minor. This unity would not be uncertain if it were certain what sacred scripture explicitly teaches. Let it pass. But if this should be uncertain, I deny. Although we pass over all the other defects of this system, this one single thing is asked. Where is the certain norm of what is explicitly taught? Now, I gave you the example of the Protestant minister who fixes my printer. And he said his son says there's nothing wrong with same-sex marriages, and he, who is also a minister. He got ordained in the Baptist church. And he says it's against Romans 1 something. This is the, my printer friend. And, well, not, well the printer fell. Uh, but he talks to me about religion. And uh, he says, I, I wouldn't even go to the ordination. You know, well, this, uh, this is wrong, and et cetera, et cetera. And I said, yes, I mean, even, you know, I mean, Protestants and Catholics uh, would agree it's in sacred scripture, and, you know, there's no argument about it. But then he said, but, you know, he is uh, something like turned on to the Lord. <laughs> so that means... Doctrine has nothing to do with your being attached to the Lord. I mean, it's, everything was all right in the end because he was turned on to the Lord and, you know, he's serving the Lord. And that shows you that, that the uh, Protestant idea of what is explicitly taught, it, it doesn't work because it is e absolutely explicitly taught that that, that, that sort of thing is evil. Uh, I think it's mentioned something like 15 times in sacred scripture, something close to that between the Old and the New Testaments. It's explicitly taught. But you can still be one with the Lord. <laughs> you know. So that... that that idea, that's why you need the, 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 that's why the church is the condition sine qua non of belief. In other words, of taking sacred scripture and saying, this is the norm of belief. This is the law of belief. The Socinians deny that the divinity of Christ is explicitly taught in the scriptures. <laughs> I and the Father are one. <laughs> the Lutherans affirm it. The Catholics believe that the real presence of Christ is explicitly proposed, but the Calvinists do not believe this. So where is the judge? My flesh is food indeed. My blood is drink indeed. And even when they challenged him and said, oh, how can we drink his blood and etc.? He emphasized it again. He didn't say, you, you're misunderstanding me. He, he said it again. And then they all walked away. They were his disciples. These were not the Pharisees. These were the disciples. Except a few of them. And that's when uh, he said to the, to the apostles, um, will you go also? And St. Peter said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. But yeah, it's John 6. I mean, you couldn't get more explicit than John 6 about the real presence of Christ. So the, the Protestant system doesn't work. And that's why they have so many Protestant churches. But they're all tuned into the Lord. See, they're all in communion with each other. You know. They don't excommunicate each other or anything like that. If you're a Methodist, you can go to the Baptist church. And they would welcome you, and you, you know, you're part of, you're a Christian and all that. So, 
instance, what the scriptures explicit, explicitly teach is known by the common consent of Christians. Therefore, there is not lacking a certain norm of fundamental truths. Response, I distinguish the antecedent. This common consent is valid if the true organization of Christians is already known with certitude. I concede. If this true organization is not previously known with certitude, I deny. The adversaries take those things in order to conclude to precisely what is sought, for the very question is where is the norm by which the true organization of Christians can be recognized. So their, their, their reasoning is circular. Where is the true Christian church? It's where you have common consent of Christians. <laughs> Instance, it is, is, it is sufficient to believe that truth by which eternal life is obtained. But the truth of this type of faith is, of this type is faith in Christ, the Son of God. And then they quote scripture. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Therefore, no unity of faith is required besides faith in the Son of God. Response, I distinguish the minor. Eternal life is obtained through faith in Christ, the Son of God, including the doctrine of Christ, I concede, excluding it, I deny. St. John, in the quoted text, commends faith in Christ, which is a summary of the whole gospel. But this exalted truth does not exclude other truths. Instance, if it is necessary to believe all truths, we must conclude to implicit faith, but implicit faith is only the crassest ignorance. Response, I distinguish the major. We conclude to implicit faith in all of the articles I deny. In some, I subdistinguish. Given the proportion of condition and status, I concede. Otherwise, I deny. So he's saying that you could have implicit faith in some articles, but you can't have implicit faith in, in all of them. You must believe some explicitly. Calvin, in, his, uh, in his, his book, attacks implicit faith, as the Phineites do, as if no explicit faith is necessary for Catholics. So you must have some explicit faith, meaning there's some articles which you must know and believe. But he is positing something as certain what is in fact clearly false. Besides, implicit faith is that by which someone is prepared to explicitly believe those things which the church proposes, but which he does not yet know explicitly. This implicit faith is of supreme importance and is very apt for the preservation of unity. Because you have unity of faith if you are prepared to believe everything that the Catholic Church teaches, even if you know that you don't know all of it. For through it all the faith will adhere to one fixed, stable, and objective rule of faith. That is the unity of faith of the Catholic Church. All right. Okay, Article 3, whether the Church of Christ is holy. The definition of the mark of holiness. Holiness is a property of the church by which in doctrine, sacraments, and members, it is perfectly ordered to the divine good. It is said to be a property of the church by which it is perfectly ordered to the divine good. Perfectly. Such a state of order excludes the false and the evil and includes firmness in the true and the good. So this is going to obviously get into the Novus Ordo because it would be, it is, the, the, I mean the entire Novus Ordo is contrary to the holiness of the church. This is explained by St. Thomas in these words. The word sanctity seems to have two significations. In one way, it denotes purity, and this signification fits in with the Greek, for hagios means unsoiled. In another way, it denotes firmness, 
Wherefore, in olden times, the term sancta was applied to such things as were upheld by law and were not to be violated. That's why we say certain things are sanctioned. God bless you. See, that's from the Latin. So he's saying that both, both the Greek and the Latin pertain to holiness. For purity is necessary in order that the mind be applied to God. Since the human mind is soiled by contact with inferior things, even as all things depreciate by admixture with baser things. For instance, silver by being mixed with lead. Now, in order for the mind to be united to the supreme being, it must be withdrawn from inferior things. And hence it is that without purity, the mind cannot be applied to God. That's why you have religious life, to withdraw from the things of the world. Again, firmness is required for the mind to be applied to God, for it is applied to him as its last end and first beginning, and such things must needs be most immovable. See, the, the ultimate end, you must constantly tend to the ultimate end in everything you do. So that's absolutely immovable. So the word sancto, sancto, so the church is holy in the sense that it is absolutely immovable with regard to its uh, means of sanctification. It is necessary, therefore, that this holiness shine forth from the internal life of the church in things which are consecrated to God or sanctified by the presence of God, and this is real sanctity, and in persons, uh, and this is personal sanctity. So that's why the church blesses things and consecrates things. Anytime there is a sacred use for anything, it is at least blessed holy water, rosaries, all sorts of things. If it's, and it sets it aside for a sacred use. Uh, the, the bread and wine at Mass are blessed in the offertory because they're set aside for a sacred use. And if for any reason they are not used, uh, they cannot just be thrown away or anything like that. They have to be uh, disposed of in, in a way that is fitting with their sacred state. Now, some things are blessed for a specific use, and for example, the water used in the wine, and that can be poured down the drain. That uh, other things, um, ashes on Ash Wednesday. Yes. The wine that remains, does anybody know what can that always be poured down the drain? Does that make it even better? It, the wine is not blessed. No. Only the water is blessed, but that's only for a specific use. It's not like holy water that is permanently blessed. No, the wine can go down the drain, though. But not if it's already from the... In other words, if the, if the priest has blessed it in the offertory, if for any reason he doesn't continue the Mass, or he, or he drops dead, all right, the, that, that blessed wine from the offertory cannot be just poured down the drain. So, and then there's personal sanctity which means a removal from the world and, and uh, belonging to God. The world, in a sense, not what God has created, but uh, the, the worldliness. In other words, that's what that means. The order of the church to God shines forth in its doctrine. For this uh, very same cause, there can be nothing either in dogma or morals, notice, which turns man away from God, but it is necessary that all things be suitable to apply the mind and actions of men to God. So in morals, you, it, you also must consider discipline, in other words, the laws of the church. And you know, the, the, 
the Novus Ordo just sinks on that. But it, its, its doctrines are evil as well and contradict Catholic doctrine. In sacraments, that is, in the principal means of sanctification and principally in the sacrifice which has always been offered in the church. <clears throat> In its members, inasmuch as there is never a time in which outstanding sanctity of life is not evident in at least some of its members, but not to the point of excluding sinners from membership in the church. So sinners are members of the church, but the, it means that at least at all the time there are some people who are sanctified in the church. And they are sanctified because they are following the rules of the church. Or is that the, the, the church is a sanctifying cause, an agent. And if the people are sinners, it's because they're not following the rules of the church, meaning Ten Commandments and the disciplines of the church, etc. In other words, if you follow the rule book given to you at baptism, you're going to go to heaven. You will be sanctified and you will go to heaven. Sanctity in the means of sanctification, that is in doctrine and sacraments, is called active sanctity, and sanctity in the members is called passive sanctity. In the members of the church, three grades of sanctity are distinguished. Some are merely free from mortal sin. That means they're in the state of grace. Others are innocent of most venial sins. Most, not all. Only our Blessed Lady was completely free from venial sin by a special grace. So the, um, uh, so, but people who are very pious, like people who come to Mass every day, and uh, nuns, you know, I don't know about seminarians, but <laughs> uh, you know, people living religious life ordinarily, at least in you know in the Catholic Church, not in the Novus Ordo. Uh, others finally arrive at such a height of perfection that they operate above the common mode of activity and perform celestial things with the help of God. So the great saints. In fact, however, they, there are numberless grades of holiness. It is obvious, St. Thomas says, that charity, inasmuch as it orders man to his ultimate end, is the principle of all good works, which can be ordered to the ultimate end. But there is no end to the augmentation of charity in the state of the way, of wayfarer. That means viator in Latin. Wayfarer means somebody still living and not yet dead and judged. For charity itself, according to the ratio of its proper species, has no end to its increase. So you can't love God too much. You can't overdo charity. You know, no saint was ever criticized for loving God too much. Well, maybe they were by some rotten people, but you know, there's, there is, it's an open-ended thing. It, it's like a tree that can grow practically infinitely, in the sense that there's no, no intrinsic limit upon it. For it is a certain participation in infinite charity, which is the Holy Ghost. He is subsistent love. So charity is a participation in the subsistent love of the Trinity, who, who is the Holy Ghost. Similarly, the cause which gives increase to charity is of infinite power, namely God. Nor is there on the part of the subject any term to charity, and the subject is the person who has charity, since as charity grows, the capacity for more charity also grows. Something like a teenager who eats, all right? 
he eats and then his stomach gets bigger as he eats more and then, you know, that's an analogy. The charisms and most of all miracles can pertain to the mark of sanctity. For the gifts which are called gratiae gratis date, that means graces freely given. That's the term for them. I mean, in a sense, all grace is freely given. But these are, it's just a, a common term, which means uh, uh, supernatural gifts, which are given for the purpose of edifying others and not for the personal sanctification of the individual. All right, so the fact that St. Dominic had the gift of German which is a wonderful gift for anybody that doesn't speak German. See, that would be for the purpose of, or St. Uh, Francis Xavier speaking all those languages in the East, or the apostles being heard in all of their languages when they preach the gospel. That's a grazia gratis data. Yes? Uh, in that sense it is, yes. In other words, it, 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 it is for the, the building up of the church and the maintenance of the church and the sanctification of souls. Yes, in that sense it is. Yes. Are not given in order that man through it be justified, but instead that he cooperate in the justification of another. Indeed, if many miracles manifest equally the sanctity of the person acting, all of them manifest the sanctity of the doctrine of the preacher. See, so miracles manifest the sanctity of the doctrine of the preacher because God cannot perform a miracle in the confirmation of falsehood because that would be against his truth and against his goodness. Because God works them, miracles, for man's benefit, and this in two ways, this is St. Thomas, in one way for the confirmation of truth declared in another way, in proof of a person's holiness, which God desires to propose as an example of virtue. So many times the martyrs were preserved from various tortures, etc., uh, in proof of their own holiness. <clears throat> in the first way, miracles can be wrought by anyone who preaches the true faith and calls upon Christ's name, as even the wicked do sometimes. In the second way, miracles are not wrought except by the saints, since it is in proof of their holiness that miracles are wrought during their lifetime or after death, either by themselves or by others. For we read in Acts that God wrought by the hand of Paul miracles, and even there were brought from his body to the sick handkerchiefs, and the diseases departed from them. Because miracles by their nature are extraordinary deeds and deeds of the church, not promised to every one of its members, it is by itself evident, A, that miracles are performed only at intervals, less often or more often, as it appears suitable to the head of the church. So miracles were very prevalent in the early church and became less so as the church went on. And St. Gregory the Great even comments on this. People would say, well, you know, there's all these miracles in the early church. They're all recorded, and now we have very few. And he said, and the reason for that was because the pagan world had to be converted through those miracles. But now that the, the church is established uh, and, and people have the faith, they are less necessary. Also, the church itself is a motive of credibility. The life, which we'll see later in, in Apologetics, in De Revelazione, the life of the church itself is a motive of credibility. And that's really what attracts most people to the church, the Catholic church, is that is its internal life and its doctrines and its saints and its uh, everything about it, even the culture that it produced in Europe, for example, in, in the Catholic times, there's, you know, people are drawn. You know, somebody that was converted by Gregorian chant, 
not converted, but it, it turns your head. You see, in other words, the, there's something in the Catholic Church that will turn your head. And, and then things start. So one thing leads to another. But it has so many ways that will uh, attract people. Just the, uh, the fact that it has doctrines that make sense even with the truths of natural religion. You know, something like indissolubility of marriage. So that, that it holds out on that. And, and other things. It has, it has the strictest morality of any religion on the face of the earth. <clears throat> B, that the miracles performed demonstrate the sanctity of that church which is found to be one that is the same as that in which and for which those miraculous deeds are known. See, so they are proofs of the, you'd say, the divine origin of the church. The ideas of the adversaries. The Protestants, since they admitted either a confused or completely false doctrine concerning the unity and intimate conjunction of the visible and invisible church, were induced to deny the mark of holiness in part and in part to falsely interpret it. Many taught that the church excuse me, consists of the just alone and even of the predestined alone. So not only those who are good, but also those, only those who are predestined. Are you saved? Once you assert this, the visibility of the church is taken away. And the holiness of the church, as it is an objective institution, can no longer survive. The, if, it, if the only, the predestined are the, or the just, are members of the church, well, how do you know who is just and who is predestined? Others say that the church, as it is an institution, was completely evil, at least for a time. This is the same thing as to assert that there is no necessary sanctity of the church, but only a contingent one. See, so the, you know, the Lutherans were bound to say that you know, the church was on the wrong track until 1517. That's a long time to be on the wrong track. <laughs> Naturalists and rationalists admitted a notion of Christian sanctity, but completely stripped from it the notions of morality, dogma, and sacraments, and restricted to the duties of humanity, such as climate change and, and uh, you know, redistribution of wealth and all of those things. As they say, that is, to duties toward man, while the duties toward God are neglected. So you're holy if you are... Uh, you know, getting an electric car, you know, and, and doing things if you recycle, and do, that's holiness. It's true, that's what they think, you know. It's like a religion for them. <laughs> Plant a tree. I saw an article the other day that the rainforest in Brazil is producing more oxygen as the result of more carbon dioxide. <laughs> That's what it said. <laughs> Which would seem that if there is more carbon dioxide, that it's compensating for it by producing more oxygen because trees live off of carbon dioxide. God works in strange ways. <laughs> and that Antarctica had the coldest winter on record this past winter down there. Coldest on record. And tomorrow, on a Sunday, we're supposed to dip down into 53 at night, which is very cold for this time of year in Florida. Have to get the blankets out. <laughs> so, 
you know, so, uh, you know, that's... Uh, so, uh, thesis, the church of God is holy. Arguments, argument one from sacred scripture in general, the church has the mark of sanctity if the holy mission of Christ is continued in it and through it. But Christ's mission is continued in it and through it, ergo. The major is certain from the intrinsic and extrinsic indications of sanctity by which Christ manifested his holy mission. So he, he was, Christ manifested the mission of the sanctification of souls. Proof of the minor. The minor is the church's mission is continued. Uh, Christ's mission is continued in it and through it, through the church. That's the minor. From the end of the church, from the fact that the church is the mystical body of Christ, for Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of his body. This is St. Paul. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and delivered himself up for it that he might sanctify it, cleansing it by the laver of water in the word of life, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or novus ordo or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Well, I mean, is, is we have to apply that to the Novus Ordo. Or can we say that sentence about the Novus Ordo, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish? Can anyone say that without lying? From the fact that the, uh, see, from the fact that the heart of the church is the Holy Ghost, who remains with it forever. And the Holy Ghost is compared to the heart, St. Thomas says, who invisibly vivifies and unites the church. D, from the fact that the church is the kingdom of Christ, which is a kingdom of sanctification, as it is written, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the sanctifier of Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. Argument two, the mark of sanctity is that property of the church by which it is perfectly ordered in doctrine, sacraments, and its members toward the divine good. But the church is a society perfectly ordered to the divine good in doctrine, sacraments, and members. Ergo, the major is evidence, the very definition of holiness of the church. For in these three things, the intrinsic sanctity is externally obvious. So we're going to prove the minor. In doctrine, it is necessary that the church be holy in doctrine. One, because the doctrine of the church is from Christ who said, Amen, amen, I say unto you, that he who heareth my word and believeth him that sent me hath life everlasting and cometh not into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Two, the church teaches through Christ who promised, I am with you all days. That's the promising assistance to the church. Three, the church has the Holy Ghost, quote, another paraclete, he, the Father, will give to you that he remain with you forever, the spirit of truth. So the church has the spirit of truth. Four, Christ prayed, sanctify them in truth. That is, St. Thomas says, in the knowledge of the truth, of the faith, and of thy commandments. And the prayer of Christ is always heard. Christ cannot pray to his Father without being heard. All right, I think we'll stop there.